the next presentation with the topic Hydrogen and a Sustainable Energy System, a combination of storage medium and fuel. The presentation will be held by the chairman of Deutscher Wasserstoff- und Brennstoffzellenverband, Dr. Johannes Töppler. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here about this interesting subject. Uh, if you look about on sustainable energy systems, we should look a little bit on the actual situation of energy. And this, actua this actual situation is dominated today still by conventional energy carriers, but in future we will need sustainable energy carriers as shown here. For example, wind, photovoltaics, solar thermal energy, biomass and so on. And if we give to this figure another color, it shows like this. And here you see, for example, in the conventional energy carriers, oil, natural gas and coal, the energy is contained in matter. And matter can be stored and therefore energy can be stored. But in future, when we have wind, photovoltaics, solar thermal energy, there is no matter where the energy is bounded. And therefore, the first step of the, ed of the energy chain will be the change of wind energy or solar energy uh, into electricity. And therefore, we will have the, trend, the strategic important transfer from fuel-based energy systems where the energy is bounded in matter into an electricity chain, uh, electricity dominated uh, energy system as you seen, uh, see here. This is a strategic step of energy because this energy can be stored and electricity can be stored only in very small amounts. And another point is that the renewable energy are not constant uh, available. You see here, for example, the uh, amount of wind energy in the Aeon grid for the days from the 10th of March to 21st of March 2003. You see here around about this is a 5 gigawatt line and you see here the change of wind energy. And the, we have the situation in Germany that the wind energy has to be <coughs> uh, uh, increased by a factor of three uh, up to 2020. And the same curve upgraded with a factor of three looks like this. This is in the same uh, time frame, the result of wind energy to be available <coughs> uh, in this time. And the energy need in the same time is this curve, this brown curve, as you see here. And therefore, we have a, a partially the situation that the energy supply uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot satisfy the demand by far. And we have other days where the supply outreaches uh, the demand by a factor of more than three, for example. And this means that the energy which is needed here has to be stored from other times where we have more energy uh, as it is needed. And the figure here shows the possibility how it can work. Uh, we have in this case demonstrated wind energy, but in, in the same manner it can be uh, photovoltaics. We have the electric grid and the use in household and industry. And uh, when we have uh, a system of storage, for example, in the case of hydrogen, with electrolysis, storing in caverns, uh, re-electrified by turbines or fuel cells, it can be reused in the grid for supplying houses uh, or industry. In the same way, this hydrogen can be directly used in fuel stations for operating cars or the hydrogen can be withdrawn from the storage systems. And additionally, we can use hydrogen as gas even for households and industry. That's a system of storage. And if we, com if we compare this energy storage density with conventional systems, for example, pump storage systems, the biggest one in Germany has a power of one gigawatt and an energy storage capacity of five gigawatt hours. 
or if we compare the hydrogen uh, with adiabatic compressed air uh, storage system, we have around about uh, 23 gigawatt hours for the bigger system which is available. And we compare this with a hydrogen storage energy system, for example, in a big cavern. We see that we need hydrogen for storage of very big amounts of energy. How we need it, for example, when we have um, no wind for several days up to two weeks. That means we need urgently hydrogen for storage of energy for the times when not enough primary or renewable energy uh, is available. And <coughs> here we see the energy density once more. Hydrogen energy density is 100%. Hydrogen uh, density, energy density including the efficiencies for uh, loading and deloading it's around about 170 kilowatt hours per cubic meter and in comparison we have the volumetric storage density for the adiabatic air compression systems or even pumped hydro systems 0.7 kilowatt hours uh, uh, per cubic meter and that's the reason why uh, because we need a very high storage density for hydrogen for storing of uh, big amounts uh, of energy. That's one point. We need hydrogen for storage. But I have shown you in an earlier figure that we can use it additionally with high efficiency for cars or for mobile application. You see here one figure uh, of a, um, uh, of a, uh, a package uh, of a Daimler car. You see here the fuel cell stack working with high efficiency. The fuel stack system supply, the um, uh, electric engine, the cooler. Here is the storage systems around about 700 uh, bars hydrogen, gaseous hydrogen maximum and an additional battery. You will see a little bit later uh, uh, why the additional battery uh, is important. Here is a, a simplified demonstration once more for the package. And here you see the complete car with a storage system, fuel cell, uh, the supply system for fuel cell, the engine, and so on. And you see, for example, that this vehicle is constructed, fabricated, and approved under serial conditions. It's very important. It is serial conditions, not conditions for, a pre for an experimental car. It was tested by a turn uh, around the world in 125 days with uh, 30,000 kilometers and the start of serial production is, is to be expected by Daimler uh, in uh, 2017. <coughs> and here you see some steps of, the of last development from one car, it's a, a former A-class fuel cell car and then US B-class. You see here the advantages, the range was increased uh, to 135 percent within this generation. The consumption was reduced by 16 percent. The size of the fuel cell system was reduced by 40 percent and the power increased in the same time uh, by uh, 30 percent. You see the big uh, advantages which were uh, re uh, uh, achieved uh, in, uh, within this car generation. And there are a lot of other car manufacturing uh, companies working in on, the si on, on the same type. You see here, for example, a Honda with the fuel cell within the Cardan tunnel and additional hub uh, wheel engines in the rear axle so that you can operate even a four-wheel drive uh, with a fuel cell car if you need a four-wheel uh, drive. You see it is possible. <coughs> and another strategy, for example, from Honda, which was uh, published in uh, February last year. You see here the, uh, the expecting car, here some, um, some conditions, 100 kilowatt power uh, uh, speed maximum uh, with 160 kilometers per hour. And it was pronounced that after 2015, uh, this car will be produced uh, for, uh, for public uh, transfer. 
And uh, it is not only possible to drive passenger cars, you see here the bus from Cologne. And this bus is operated in the normal public traffic. Here is an out, uh, an a figure from outside. Here is a propulsion system uh, with an um, uh, electric source module, an additional capacitor and a battery. It's a hybridized system with a drive module and some auxiliaries. And you see the reason <coughs> for this propulsion system this is shown here. The uh, fuel cell is operated nearly continuously at the best point with very high efficiency. And the, uh, uh, the soft uh, modifications of energy need is uh, overtaken from the battery and the very quick ones by the capacitor. That means the optimum uh, availability of capacitor is used. Very quick changes of um, energy can be overtaken from, um, from the capacitor. The soft ones by the battery so that the fuel cell can be operated uh, in the best point with highest efficiency. And if we compare these systems with a pure battery system, let us look a little bit in detail of the, of the components which has to be stored. If we take a gasoline uh, or diesel vehicles, we have only gasoline uh, or diesel demonstrated in this very simplified uh, form in the chemical equation. This has to be transported. The oxygen comes from air, carbon dioxide is remitted to air and hydrogen and water vapor in the same way. In a hydrogen car, you have to take the hydrogen with you, inclusively a container. Oxygen is withdrawn from air and water vapor is given to air or exhausted. And in a battery car, you have to take for each electron at the cathode side, in this case, for this example, a lithium carbon molecule and at the, and the anode side, a lithium manganate molecule and a lithium molecule for each single electron. And therefore, if you want to double the range for a long range operation, you have in the vehicle car quite twice the size of a uh, um, uh, of tank. Uh, you have the same doublification of the tank of hydrogen. And if you take the double size of the battery, you see that this will become very, very heavy because you need for each electron a complete uh, summary of molecules of uh, lithium or lithium manganate. And therefore, long ranges are not, are not suitable uh, for pure battery cars. And I told you that a fuel cell car, here is a, mo a, a model of a fuel cell car, is additionally operated by a battery. There are two reasons to do this. The first one is if we want to brake, we can use the electric engine uh, uh, for electricity uh, production as generator. This electricity is stored in, uh, in a battery and can be reduced. That's a, a braking energy recovery. The other point is if we want to heat a car, uh, then a pure battery vehicle has to withdraw the energy for heating the car from the battery, which reduces the range. In the case of a fuel cell car, we can, an, uh, we can uh, realize an intelligent operation. For example, if we, uh, if we park the car with an empty battery and we can produce electricity before starting the car by the fuel cell. This electricity is stored in the battery and with the, with the heat of the reaction in the fuel cell can be used for heating up the car without any uh, reduction of the range. And uh, uh, if we operate the car partially from the battery, partially from the fuel cell, we can heat the, heart by, uh, the car by the waste heat of fuel cell. And if we arrive and 
we can um, regulate uh, the rest of range by so that the energy that the battery at our goal is empty then we can start again and we can uh, uh, heat the car before driving and even during the driving and therefore a combination with battery is very helpful for the operation of the car <coughs> and in a very interesting investigation the battery vehicles or the optimization of battery vehicles was uh, investigated in combination with fuel cell vehicles and you see that for small cars with uh, long with short ranges per year around about less than 20,000 kilometers battery vehicles have advantages due to the efficiency because we don't lose efficiency for example for hydrogen production but with very big cars uh, especially uh, when the cars are big and have l a long ranges or need long ranges we need fuel cell vehicles in a hybridized uh, form and the same the same was investigated by Toyota. The figure is a little bit other, but for short-range cars and small cars, we have the electric vehicle for longer-range cars and bigger cars, the fuel cell vehicles. This investigation was made by a lot of companies with the same result as you see here. And uh, you see here the concept of Toyota for the same application. And now let me say some words additionally with respect uh, <coughs> to biomass. We can use biomass by different productions, biodiesel, ethanol from wheat, ethan ethanol from short uh, for, uh, rotation forestry. And you see here on this figure how many cars I can operate with a result of round about uh, one hectare and the measure is 12,000 kilometers per year with different engines, diesel, auto or fuel cell. And you see <coughs> that in the case of biodiesel, ethanol from wheat, ethanol from short rotation forestry, we can operate round about three to four vehicles per hectare. If we use hydrogen, for example, in a fuel cell, by short by biomass from short rotation forestry, it comes nearly up to 10. <coughs> if we use photovoltaics, we come to 70 cars, or in the case of wind energy, we come to round about 20 cars at per hectare, whereby in the case of wind energy, the area can be used twice, even additionally for agriculture. And let us have a look a little bit, a, a, a comparison to better to um, uh, biological cars. When we have biomass for car application, we have to look very, very carefully for which application we use it. You see here the efficiency of a fuel cell. And you see that a fuel cell at high power, that means, for example, high velocities, has this shape. In the case of diesel, we have this shape, and for a gas uh, engine, for example, gasoline or even gaseous engine, we have this shape. And you see, for example, a passenger car is mainly operated in this range. In this case, a fuel cell has a very, very high efficiency. A bus is g uh, generally operated in the average in this, uh, 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 in this field. And we see here a very high <coughs> efficiency for the fuel cell uh, and low efficiency from, from combustion engines. The reason is the so-called physical Carnot process uh, was increasing efficiency by increasing temperature and this means increasing load. And now we have to look when we have enough biomass, where do we use it? The best way is to use it in this, in cars, or uh, other systems uh, which are operated mainly at very high power. These are, these are ships, airplanes or long-range trucks, not passenger cars because the efficiency here is absolu has absolutely advantages for the fuel cell. Therefore, if we have biomass, then please uh, use it um, 
for optimized uh, energy or efficiency. And we, I will give you one example for using biomass. And this example is a, a H2 balance. If we use, uh, <coughs> so sorry, E2, E10 balance. If we use E10, that means in 50 liters E10 fuel, we have five liters of ethanol. And these five liters of ethanol correspond or have an energy density with 106 megajoule. And this corresponds to an, um, uh, an amount of wheat of 12.5 uh, kilowatt. Uh, kilograms. And for the operation for producing the energy from heat, we need energy for this process. And this process is round about 80 megajoule. And this energy is generally not carbon dioxide free. But if we calculate it in, uh, as carbon dioxide free, by additional other biomass, we need additionally 9.5 kilogram wheat. That means, in summary, uh, we need <coughs> uh, uh, 22 kilograms uh, wheat for one filling E10. And this corresponds to round about the result of uh, 39 square meters of farmland. And with a consumption of 6 liter per 100 kilometers, we need around about 2.5 kilogram bread for 100 kilometer. And for an annual range of 15,000 kilometers, it corresponds to 375 kilogram of bread or 585 uh, square meters of farmland. And if we don't take E10, but pure ethanol, we have to multiply these values uh, additionally by a factor of 10. And another idea is very often discussed if we produce for storage pr purposes electricity from wind energy, we make electrolysis and we have uh, a hydrogen. Then to transfer this hydrogen to synthetic methane by Sabatier process, in this case, we have an additionally uh, efficiency loss of 70%. This is this path. Then we have synthe synthetic natural gas. And by this, we have a combustion engine for, uh, for natural gas. Then we have this efficiency chain. In the case uh, of using hydrogen directly, we, and after this, using the fuel cell, it's for the propulsion of the car. We finally come to 30% in the case of the uh, uh, synthetic natural gas path, we have round about 12. And one argument is, if this electricity from wind energy, for example, is a surplus and has no price, zero price, it is a surplus, it cannot be used uh, directly, then it doesn't matter how much is here the efficiency. But if we make the same investigation with the energy which we need at the wheel of a car and we normalize this to one and we go back this chain, then we see that we need a factor of 3.4 uh, times the energy which we need at the wheel. And in the case of the path of methanization and using synthetic natural gas in a combustion engine with low efficiency, we come to a factor of 8.3 roundabout. That means we need bigger electrolysis systems and <coughs> we need bigger transportation systems in order to have the same energy at the wheel. If the efficiencies are compared, we have to start with the efficiency you need. And then you have to look for the efficiency you have to put in the system uh, for the early beginning. Only in this visualization, you see the differences of energy. And if you want to compare different energy paths for different uh, renewable uh, primary energies, you can do it yourself. Daimler has a system called OptiResource. And if you go with OptiResource in internet, 
you can use <coughs> the in the uh, primary energy you can use a propulsion system of gas or of uh, vehicles for example fuel cells combustion engines you can look for the fuel electricity or something else and what you get is finally <coughs> the result of looking for the uh, fu for the uh, fuel amount you need the carbon dioxide emissions for the whole pass or only for the propulsion system you can calculate it for your own if you use it in this internet page <coughs> uh, but uh, the hydrogen cannot be only used for uh, for street transportation for buses and passenger cars it can be used uh, for small ships like this um, a uh, passenger ship in the harbor of Hamburg. You see here a demonstration of the ship uh, with uh, uh, hydrogen containers, batteries, fuel cells, uh, and propulsion system. You can use it for airplanes, not for a propulsion, but for, um, for auxiliary use systems for the electric support of uh, the whole plane. And you can use, in this case, the wastewater um, for the for toilets, you can use uh, heat for, heated, uh, for heating as a cabin, you can use the waste air for, uh, um, uh, for the tanks in order to, um, uh, uh, to protect them against fire because you have less air in, in the system, you, you can use it for a lot of things. You can use uh, hydrogen for stationary applications with fuel cells for example for infrastructure for t uh, telecommunication for backup uh, energy supply systems for example if the uh, electric system fails even for these examples and you can use it <coughs> additionally for safety systems because the uh, the waste air from fuel cells has reduced uh, oxygen concentration so that nothing in this atmosphere can burn and therefore we can use hydrogen uh, uh, as fire protection. We have a lot of applications of hydrogen and in the, comp uh, in the combination of storing energy for, uh, for smoothing the energy demand and supply and, uh, <coughs> and additionally a lot of technical applications, for example, here is a protected area by fuel cells for this application. Uh, and <coughs> for this we have the chance to use hydrogen for a lot of applications. And this was my last transparency. Thank you very much for your attention. And maybe we see sometimes uh, at our internet page or even at our booth right here in the same row. S uh, several boots away. Thank you very much for your attention.